five. And we're ready. Good evening. I'd like to uh, call the Township of Waynefleet regular council meeting of May 31st, 2022 to order. And we'd like to do the national anthem first, please. We would like to begin our meeting by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, acknowledging the One Bowl and Spoon Treaty. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, moving on to the Mayor's uh, remarks. Uh, you'll notice that we're dressed down a little bit this evening. Uh, the air conditioners are not working and it's uh, 83 degrees in here. so. Uh, we took our jackets off. Uh, please note that the meeting proceedings are being broadcast live, recorded, and made available through the Township website and YouTube.com. With June just around the corner, I'd like to acknowledge International Pride Month and offer my support for our Niagara's LGBTQ plus communities. And Niagara Pride Week kicked off on Saturday, May 28th, and events will be held until Sunday, June the 5th. I'll be attending the Port Colborne Wayfleet Community Living Anniversary Celebration this Saturday afternoon at the Market Square in Port Colborne. And our next regular meeting of council will be held on June the 21st at 7 p.m. Are there any councillor remarks? Councillor Cridland. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, the next NPCA board meeting will be Friday, June 17th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, adoption of previous council minutes. Are there any comments or corrections for the draft minutes listed on our agenda? Anything? No, not seeing anything. So I'll read the motion that the minutes of the meeting of council held May 10th, 2022 be adopted as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor McClellan and Councillor Van Vliet. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. And we're going to move into a public meeting, purpose of our public meeting. In accordance with the Planning Act, a public meeting is held for applicants to present their proposal to the council and the public for council to receive comments from the public. Staff will not make a recommendation and council will not make a decision on the proposal at this evening's meeting. A planning report will be brought forward by staff and considered by council at a later date. As a member of the public, you are welcome to request to be notified of any future meetings respecting the applications. Please provide your contact information on the sign-in sign in sheet located at the back of council chambers or contact the deputy clerk. Please be advised that the sign-in information will form part of the public record for the applications. And I'll look to our planner now to speak to this uh, topic. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the subject lands are located on the west side of Pettit Road between Highway 3 and Bell Road, uh, located within, within the hamlet of Winger. I'll just give one moment for the presentation to come up. Uh, 
Uh, so on the screen is the subject lands outlined in red. Um, the subject lands are approximately 8.93 hectares in size and are currently being used for agricultural purposes. And the surrounding land uses include residential and agricultural with some institutional and commercial uses further north within the hamlet. Uh, subject lands are designated as hamlet in the regional official plan, village residential in the township official plan, and zone development D and hazard H under zoning bylaw 581.78. The draft plan of subdivision proposes 15 lots for single detached dwellings. There's one block for the existing municipal drain, uh, two blocks for stormwater management, one block for water supply for firefighting purposes, and two public roads. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment proposes to rezone the lands from development D and hazard H to a residential R1 358 zone and hazard H zone. The site specific provision 358 seeks a reduction in the minimum lot frontage for lots 5, 6, 10, and 11. A number of studies and reports and drawings were submitted in support of the applications. Uh, this includes the draft plan of subdivision drawing, a stage one and two archeological assessment, an envir environmental impact statement, hydrogeological assessment, phase one and phase two environmental site assessment, uh, planning justification brief and addendum, civil drawings, sewage system servicing design, stormwater management design brief, uh, and water servicing design brief. So the circulated notice of public meeting as well as the studies, reports, and drawings are posted on the township's website at waynefleet.ca slash public notices. These studies are currently undergoing technical review by township staff and external agencies and that review will inform a future staff report to council. There have been several agency comments received on the applications to date. Um, the Ministry of Transportation noted that the subject lands are outside of the Ministry's permit control limit uh, and as such they offered no further comments or requirements. However, they did note that any future access to Highway 3 will not be permitted. Hydro 1 noted no comments or concerns at this time. Canada Post requested conditions of draft approval to address mail service delivery through a centralized mailbox. Bell Canada noted no objection and advised that the owner shall contact Bell Canada during the detailed design stage uh, to confirm the provision of communication and telecommunication infrastructure and requested as a condition of draft approval um, a clause regarding relocation of facilities or easements should any conflicts arise. The Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority uh, requested additional information before being able to provide finalized comments on the proposed applications. Uh, this included an updated aquatic habitat assessment, review of the vegetation communities and their connections to the water course, uh, as well as an erosion and sediment control plan. Niagara Region noted no objection sub subject to several conditions of draft approval uh, for, uh, regarding clauses for a future subdivision agreement, um, clearance from the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, Culture Industries, uh, for the archaeological study, erosion and sediment control plan, uh, grading plan, and a landscape enhancement plan. Uh, a number of township departments have also reviewed the applications, such as operations, drainage, and fire, and um, planning staff continue to work with these departments to develop appropriate conditions uh, to inform a future staff report. So the purpose of the meeting this evening is to receive public input on the proposed applications and written comments can also be submitted uh, to the township. Um, the applicant's agent ha also has a, a brief presentation, so I'll turn it over to him. Okay, thank you. And I uh, invite Michael Sullivan from Land Pro Planning Solutions to the podium, please. And uh, Michael will be making a presentation on behalf of the applicant. Good evening, Your Worship and members of council, staff and, uh, and the public. I will try not to repeat what uh, Sarah's already presented. She did a very thorough job, so thank you for that. Oops, how do we... There we go. You've seen the location already. Subject property is there at the southwest corner of, of uh, Winger. It is inside the Hamlet boundaries, which is why, which is why we're here for tonight with a uh, subdivision application. That's a summary of what we're proposing for the zoning amendment, development and hazard to a residential one exception, which Sarah's already gone into. 
Uh, perhaps I can explain the, the, why the exception. Uh, when we get to the actual lot uh, layer, I'll show that to you. We're asking for one plan of subdivision, total area of 8.93 hectares, and that's 15 lots is what's being proposed. So the drawing, as you can see in front of you, shows the, the subdivision as we propose it. It's gone, undergone a few changes since it was submitted to the township, uh, among them going, dropping from 17 to 15 lots. We included the, uh, you can see the green area there, which is the municipal drain with a setback on both sides. And you can see the brown area, which is public utility, that's stormwater management area. Uh, there are two stormwater ponds. One was initially proposed, there are now two to handle uh, the anticipated, any anticipated changes in the water flow. And that's based on our engineers that have worked on this project. And Street B, you can see in the, in the center, actually that's going to be a road allowance. It's, it'll be unopened. Uh, it, it'll exist such that if uh, there's development to the future, in the future to the north, it'll provide access to that. And the reason for, you can see the lots in the southwest corner, the pie-shaped lots, at the corner, there's insufficient frontage to meet the township's minimum. That's why the request is made for a reduced lot frontage in that area. So the changes, I've just mentioned most of them. Uh, the municipal drain has a 15 meter setback, no development setback on both sides. The fire pond was relocated to lot one or adjacent to lot one. I mentioned about the two lots, uh, the stormwater pond being split into two. And all changes have been made. This is by the township. We negotiated this earlier this year. So the application is for development to Hamlet Residential. There's some details on it. Minimum lot frontage is approximately, uh, we're requesting is 28.4 meters for those lots in order that they can meet, may, uh, maintain the requirements, meet the other requirements of the township. And you can see all the different points there. Comments, as Sarah's noted, the region has no objection to the, to the uh, application, but it's normal for, many, for applications to receive a list of conditions. We anticipate, should Council approve this, that there will be a, a, a series of conditions required to meet as part of the draft plan to make it final, and that would be what's mentioned up there. And... That's it at the moment. I thank you, and I'm here for any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. So, uh, questions from Council now, either to Sarah or to Mr. Sullivan. Councillor Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mike, uh, have you considered um, uh, <clears throat> another road from the going east from the cul-de-sac to the... Um, to the lot on the north side of Municipal Drain. Like I understand the purpose for, um, for the road allowance um, <clears throat> coming off the east-west portion to the south, but, but if that other, portion, that other portion would ever get developed, then you'd have to deal with the Municipal Drain. So in my view, it would be prudent to, to leave a road allowance off that cul-de-sac to the east in between whatever those lots are, three and five, four and five, <clears throat> to provide access to, for the same purpose that you're, you're leaving the one to the south, exactly the same reason. Mm -hmm. Municipal drain is always gonna be a problem and you don't wanna have to deal with a bridge or a culvert there. So, <clears throat> just my thoughts, I don't know whether you've considered it or not, but in my view, it might be a good idea. Through the mayor to Councillor Gilmore, we did extensively consider that. And if I can have uh, slide six, a couple of slides further, if I can have that, the plan shown again, two slides, one slide back, the graphic, thank you. So we did look at that, and it was decided in negotiation with the township to leave it where Street B is identified. The area to, which access, provides access to the property to the north, which doesn't, it won't have enough space. If you look at the front, there's not enough space to provide. You can build a house there, and or a, a dwelling there, and a couple of dwellings in the back. You can subdivide it there. We decided, uh, as I said, with the township, that you can access Highway 3 directly from the property to the north. 
So it would be easier to go from street B straight through up to the top rather than coming, you'd almost have to do a C format, I guess is what I'm saying. If you come in from the north, it just it makes it, it makes it more awkward, if I can say. So that was considered quite seriously. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Councillor uh, McClellan. Michael, I see you have four lots here that don't meet the minimum frontage. Um, why can't you just, I know you're going to make them bigger, but you'd end up making lot seven bigger, five and six get amalgamated, and lot four would get bigger. We're in the country. Why do we want short little frontages on these properties? I know it's money, but it's not what really fits in with what we're looking for in town. Through the mayor to, to Councilor McClellan, the whole subdivision is designed with the same size lots. They're, they all meet the minimum. I understand that. I'm talking about road frontage. I understand that, Councilor. My understanding, and I haven't discussed finances with my clients, but I understand that it would, it would jeopardize the financial the possibility of this, prop, of this property, of this development. I don't think losing two lots in this whole thing would make that big a difference. And it would be more conducive to what the rest of the town has to look like and everybody else has to deal with. So that's my two cents on it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Van Vliet. Thank you for the presentation, Michael. I have, um, my biggest concern is the municipal drain. I know that this land is wet to begin with. So I notice on the drawing there's no swales or swells, however you say it, in the back of the properties. So do we know how they're going to be excavated and where they're going to drain to? And the second part is when the municipal drain gets cleaned, you have to have the, the equipment go in. And generally, it's just piled up on the bank. It's not chucked away. It's just left there. The farmer plows it in. What's going to happen with the debris in this one? Have we thought that far ahead? Thank you. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Van Vliet, you have, you've asked two questions. Stormwater management, we, did, we have had Halix Engineering. They've done a full stormwater management study, which is being reviewed, as Sarah mentioned, uh, by, by folks hired by, by specialists, hired by the township to do this. They provided full swales and full, full stormwater management facilities that, that address township requirements at this point and regional requirements. So that's the first point. To address the drain, if you can see on the drawing the green area and the brown areas, that's all there because of the drain. So the municipal drain goes through the center of that green area and uh, in the, through discussions with the township, a 15 meter setback was provided each side of the drain to provide for township access to that in the future to maintain it, including cleaning out, including repairing it, and what have you, and to ensure there's enough space to handle whatever water flow comes in. So it's, it has been accounted for. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I have one more question. You keep referring to the municipal drain as a green space. It's not technically a green space, is it? Through the Mayor to Councillor Van Vliet, it's zoned as environmental protection. That's the zone for it. We do recognize and understand it is a municipal drain, which is under the Drainage Act. We do understand. We have heard from the Township Drainage Superintendent that it is treated that way. But according to plan, uh, the regional and township planning rules that we have to work with, it's considered to be an environmental protection zone. It's just a different, different name for the same thing. Mm, okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Cridland. Uh, thank you. This is probably uh, through you, Mayor, maybe to Sarah, for um, options that uh, might um, consider one less lot. Is that something that you can just take away from comments and you'll maybe discuss that and see what that would do to uh, either reduce the frontage? I, I know from previous, um, well, the little experience we've done with these, you know, uh, Variances will continue to come in no matter where we land. So um, just looking at one less lot perhaps would be something that you could take away. And then things like, um, you know, adding fences as part of the subdivision plan or anything to do with lighting. Is that something we do a little bit later or maybe after the um, public comments? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Cridlin. Um, so in terms of fences and uh, I think you mentioned lighting as well. Um, that's something we can deal with through uh, 
conditions of draft approval or through the subdivision agreement. So uh, that's something that can be negotiated between township staff and the applicant in terms of what we will permit within the subdivision. Um, however, if council has any feedback now, that would be appreciated and we can keep that in mind as we move forward with uh, reviewing and considering this application. Yep, carry on. Uh, thank you, then I'll continue. Um, maybe uh, then if uh, staff, thank you, uh, to look into one or two other types of noise of site, sorry, light um, pollution types of uh, conditions that we could at least consider um, from other jurisdictions. Uh, you know, again, as we do more of this, more lights aren't really what people are moving here for. So that's one. And then um, again, you'll just maybe look at the other, uh, whether there's a fencing that can be added. Maybe that's something that helps with the drainage or where people are going to have sight lines. So um, maybe just consider that in your comments as a way of uh, helping people get along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from Council? Councillor Gilmore? Thank you, Mayor. Just on that topic, uh, Sarah, uh, the resident uh, immediately to the south of the access off Pettit Road, I know for sure, is going to want a visual barrier from cars that will be continually turning into that area. Uh, and I would expect that the one uh, to the north will feel the same way. So that that's going to be a condition for sure, so you might as well just think about how you're going to deal with that because mm -hmm. they're going to be disrupted the most from people accessing off Pettit Road. Okay, thank you. Councillor Van Vliet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to add to that. I think that the resident on Pettit Road to the east, as you come right out, you're going to get headlights right there. So has that been taken into consideration? Because if you put 15 lots in there, you're going to have a minimum of 30 cars. That's quite a lot. Through the Mayor to Councillor Van Vliet, I believe a photometric study is required, which would address the lighting and other matters discussed earlier. Uh, the township, to my knowledge, did not request a traffic study or did not ask for that, so we can certainly discuss it with them and how to best address it. Can I continue? Yes, please. In your opinion, would a traffic study be favorable here? Because this is 15 houses on this road is, is for me, a bit excessive, seeing how there's going to be at least two cars and then if they have children and their grandchildren, what have you. That's that's a lot of traffic on that road. Through the mayor to the councillor, there's a couple of things, uh, first of all, that there's no other frontage on, on Pettit Road except this, this spot. So there's only one point of access, which makes it challenging. Uh, I have seen in other developments that I've worked on where you have a bit of flexibility with the, with the land. You can adjust, the, adjust the, um, the road somewhat. In this case, we don't have that luxury. Um, a 14 lot subdivision with all, is, is not huge. I know for Winger it, it's, it's, it is quite large. It is not mm -hmm. huge and I don't, um, in discussion with the township there's never, there was never a request for a traffic study of that nature. So I can't speak to it beyond that because I'm not a traffic engineer. Okay. Councillor McClellan. Through you, Mr. Mayor, so if I could then, Sarah, I would see, strongly suggest we do a traffic study on it and we also figure out what's going to happen to the people directly across because there's going to be cars washing across that street and all these people bought houses in a rural area that didn't have that. We don't live in the city. That happens all the time. I mean, even if you go down my street and we're pretty well populated, most of the driveways are zigzagged across so when you come out you're not washing the house and we're far enough set back on the roads and they put trees and stuff there so you're not washing people's living rooms or bedrooms or kitchens with lights every time you go in and out. So again, we're in the country, it's not like we're in a subdivision in St. Catharines or Niagara Falls so something we, you know, in the city expect that. So I would definitely look at that and look at some way to mitigate it, whether you've got to plant trees for the neighbor across the street or do something with them to landscape that so it's not going to happen. But okay, so can that be direction to staff, uh, Sarah, to uh, 
look at doing a traffic study here? Uh, yes, if, if I may comment on that. Um, so uh, as Mr. Sullivan mentioned, I mean, this is 15 lots. Typically, a traffic study doesn't kick in until we have about 200 peak trips. Um, and certainly the subdivision will not uh, generate that type of volume. Um, so that's why we didn't require the traffic study. In terms of your comments um, from the lot on the east side of Pettit Road and headlights uh, into their property, we could look at um, what may be appropriate to mitigate that. Um, but it's my opinion that a traffic study is not warranted for, for 15 lots. So if we can, then let's look at how we protect the people across the street, right? So, yeah. So if we can, let's look at how we can protect the people across the street. Thank you. Okay. If there are no further questions, we we'll now uh, request comment or input from the gallery. If there's anybody in the public that would like to speak to this, please. Now is your opportunity to do so. Please come to the podium, ma'am and state your name and your address. My name is Barbara Kirpita. I live at 43283 Pettit Road. Um, I also have a PowerPoint presentation and, and Sarah could use your help in, um, in getting it set up. Just, okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, and I have handouts for, for council, but I'm, the sign says I can't come up that way, so maybe somebody could pass them. My presentation is only about 45 minutes long, so um, it's a joke, okay? I know it's hot. <laughs> so. Yeah, and so we'll cover that off. So. Uh, <laughs> it's actually 10 minutes you're allowed. Okay. <laughs> and at nine minutes, I'll let you know that you have one minute left. Perfect, okay. Thanks. So um, let, me, let me get started. Okay, Sarah, I don't know what to do here. Is the button uh, pushed? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. This process has been an interesting one for me, and I've learned a lot. I've also had the opportunity to get to know some more of our neighbors and realize once again that Wayne Fleet is, a, is really a great place in which to live. Why am I showing you a picture of my beautiful rescue dogs on the screen? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, you can't, you can't see the picture. Um, I put it up there to make you smile and to make you realize that I am not here to present a confrontational presentation. The neighbors that I've spoken with all understand that the development is going to happen in the, in the hamlets. We get it. We know that that's where it's going to go. Having said that, we do have some requests that we think are reasonable and that could result in a win-win-win situation. All we are asking is that when you are making the decision that you follow the rules that have been established and be fair to everyone. Our first request is that the lots be redesigned. We are asking this for several reasons. In speaking with the neighbors, drainage and flooding were the number one concern um, that people had regarding the number of houses in the subdivision. We all know that drainage is a big issue in Wayne Fleet. And yes, there was a storm water management um, design brief that was submitted, but it uses IDF curves from the city of Welland. And Environment and Climate Change Canada says that using these curves alone doesn't work for long-term planning. Canada is experiencing and will continue to experience precipitation as the climate continues to change. More rain will be coming in a shorter amount of time. We all saw what happened in 2005 in Toronto, and I know Toronto was different, but a lot of rain came down in a, in a short period of time. We know that Canada is experiencing the, the impact of climate change at a higher rate than the rest of the world, and it's warming twice as fast as the others. During the past half century, Canada has become wetter and has seen more severe precipitation events. These events are, are causing flood risk throughout Canada, and Wayne Fleet is not exempt, exempt from this risk. This increase in rainfall will have a significant impact on drainage systems. 
for the last several years in our neighborhood when we've had a lot of rain, our neighbors and we have had flooding in our backyard. So that we've, never, we've been here 20 years, we've never had just standing water in our yards before, and, and that is happening. So we need to plan to, to deal with these changes in the climate. The proposed subdivision is surrounded by a floodplain, as, as you can see on the, on the screen in blue. And current residents who live on Highway 3 um, along this drain are very concerned that the current plan is to drain all the water from the subdivision to and through this drain. This drain will become very active after heavy rainfall, and some of these families have young children. And if you know the houses that I'm talking about on Highway 3, the drain is there. there there's, no, there's no fences or anything, so it's in their front yards, and they've got little kids, and they're worried about this. The next reason we're asking for a redesign of the plans is the township's official plan. It states that there will be limited growth in the hamlets, providing that the development is consistent with the character of the community. I looked for a definition of what limited growth in terms of municipal guidelines means, and I found that in rural areas, limited growth is 1 to 2 percent growth. So let's, let's be generous. Let's say limited growth is 4 percent. The approval of these homes, along with the other homes that have already been approved in the hamlet of, of Winger, results in an over 25% increase in growth in, in, in Winger. So we just ask that you consider that point as you, as you make these decisions. For all of these reasons, we request that zoning bylaw 581-78 be followed. For, as, as you've heard, four of the proposed homes have lot frontage less than 46 meters. The only apparent reason is to have more homes in the subdivision. I'm not a planner. I'm not an expert in bylaws. I don't know the reason for this particular bylaw. But if we don't need it, then get rid of it. But if we need it, then let's follow it. We are also asking that the area around McCollum Drain be zoned as environmental protection. I firmly believe that we are the stewards of this land and we need to do a better job of taking care of it. Our second request is an easy one. We ask that a park be established in the proposed subdivision. The township official plan again says that a park will be established in each hamlet using 5% of land from residential development. Winger does not currently have a, a, a park or green, uh, green space. And the Winger School, the area around the Winger School doesn't count because it belongs to the school board, it's not parkland, and it has no trespassing signs on it, so it's not an especially welcoming spot. Our next request also deals with something that we were just talking about. We're asking that trees be planted uh, around the properties of people who are going to be affected. We're asking that these trees be four to five feet tall evergreens so that people don't have to wait a long time to, have to get the, to be the benefit of the trees. Many of you saw from the Traver property that headlights coming from the subdivision road are going directly into their living room. And Ryan Traver is here tonight and I think is going to speak to that. So this simple request will have a big impact on the current residents around the subdivision. And our last request is that there is a traffic study done at Pettit Road. Pettit Road is typical for Waynefleet. It isn't very wide, it has deep ditches, and it doesn't have much of a shoulder. And on two separate occasions, I've needed to jump into that deep ditch with my dogs when cars passing didn't give me enough room when I was walking along the side. There are young families living on Pettit Road, and we hope that you give them a park to walk to. So we know that the houses in this subdivision will have more than two cars each. People are having their families and, and teenagers living with them, so there's going to be more than two cars at each home. We have some questions related to the, to the traffic study. One is re regarding the mailboxes, but I heard that, that Canada Post has said that there will be a community mailbox. Will that be on the corner of Paddock Road? Will that change the traffic pattern? Will school buses be going into the subdivision or will, will children be congregating at the corner of Paddock Road? 
We estimate that there'll be water trucks having to go into the subdivision probably every other day for the number of houses that are there, and what impact will that have on the corner of Pettit Road. And the final question we have is, if people are parking on the road in the subdivision, will that have an impact on, on emergency vehicles going in? Thank you for your time and for your attention. We have a cat, and we wanted to include the cat in the pictures. Um, we've already submitted the questions to you, but I've added a few more so you have the, the newest list of, of questions. So please let me know if you have questions for me or if you need any clarification. If we're going to do this, then let's do it the right way and follow the rules that we have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Barb. And in this forum here, uh, we don't ask questions. So I, I understand your that. Your points are made. I saw our planner making notes uh, and a lot of uh, good points and valid points there thank you. for us to consider. So thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this uh, in the public meeting, please? Okay, sir, come forward. And just state your name and your address, please. Uh, Ryan Traver, 43281 Pettit Road. I am the property to the east. Um, I did have a lot of things to say, but you've all done such a wonderful job of covering them all. Um, all I can say is, uh, please do consider all the things that have been said here. Uh, great points were made. Uh, the light study, uh, light pollution is going to be a real big one for the entire area, especially my home. Uh, we will have 30 plus cars facing us morning, night. Um, I have children at home. We don't, you know, Wayne Fleet is find your country space, right? It's not have lights shining at you 24-7. Um, and as far as the drainage, it's been well spoken to. Uh, everything's been covered, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Yeah, the drainage is definitely a, an important issue and uh, well spoken to as well. So is anybody else uh, care to come forward? Please come forward. And state your name and your address, please. My name is Gerda Misdorp, but I live at 53469 Mar Road. I'm sorry, your name again, please? Gerda Misdorp. Um, Can you spell your last name, please? M-I-S-D-O-R-P as in Peter. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, you my concern is that Waynefleet is a country environment, and I've looked at different areas, Binbrook, has exploded, Font Hill, Fenwick, Welland, and it just keeps going and going. And I just feel that this is just a start of a big explosion. When you give somebody an inch, they take a mile. And I think this is just gonna keep escalating and we're going to lose farmland. And mind you, we can buy everything from Mexico if we want, but this is Wayne Fleet. this is um, country. And, um, I've talked to Sarah and about the engineers. I know I have a ditch across the road. Back when I moved there, back in the 70s, that ditch drained. That ditch now holds water. For some reason, they think water runs uphill in Waynefleet. So that's a big concern of mine about water. If they're going to move things around, redirect water, water doesn't run uphill. It has a way to go. And so now I have water in a ditch with sits there all year long. So um, that's one of my concerns. And I thank Barb for addressing a lot of the other ones. And um, yeah, I just want you to consider this plan carefully, very carefully, because God gave us this land and we have to be good stewards. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Gerda, and very good points. Uh, this is an issue that we will consider very carefully, all aspects of it, just for the public to know that. Uh, it's, it's important that it gets done properly. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this, please, in a public setting? Anyone else? Okay, so I will now close the public meeting. That concludes the public meeting for the proposed draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment. If you wish to be notified of the decision of council regarding the proposed applications, 
you must make a written request to the deputy clerk of the township. And I want to thank everybody for uh, coming forward and speaking on this. We'll now move into uh, delegations. And our first delegation is Leslie Dodlin, Waynefleet resident, regarding a request for amendment to our noise bylaw by number 42-2018. And Leslie, I'll ask that you'd come to the podium and you have 10 minutes. And I'll let you know when nine minutes rolls around. Okay. Honorable you can take your mask off if you wish. No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, you, thank I, you. Sorry, I hope nobody feels put out by that. Uh, Honourable Mayor Gibson and Council, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to bring forward a delegation from the Harborview Road area. The delegation is requesting respectfully that Council consider regarding uh, making amendments to bylaw 042-2018. Currently, as it does not uh, provide a mechanism by which noise generated can be controlled between the hours of 07 and 2300 hours. Currently, the bylaw enables adjacent properties and anyone using them to create noise that disturbs neighbours for 16 hours a day. The noise and the vibration generated by human sound made by an individual or other human produced noise that is unnecessarily loud in such a manner which is likely to disturb the peace, quiet, comfort or repose of any other inhabitant needs to be included and worked into the current bylaw. Much tighter time restraints are also requested. The current bylaw defines point of reception, however, it needs to be expanded and redefined to include the outdoor square footage of adjacent and neighboring properties. We have found and audio taped that the noise generated by voices alone has the capacity to find a secondary point of reception beyond 225 feet. Noise generated at properties, um, especially those abutting Lake Erie, are amplified and carried further than properties not on the lake front. For one moment, imagine yourself a night shift worker. You come home from a 12-hour night shift in hell. You tuck yourself into bed, and you realize that the property adjacent yours is again rented out to renters. Another group is there, and all day long through your walls, you are kept awake by loud voices, uh, screams of enjoyment as the beer pong game for the bachelor bachelorette party is about to start, and um, past experience is telling you that they are here to get their money's worth because they've paid to stay. So with no recourse as a result of lenient or lacking definitions and inclusions in the current bylaw, you're forced to endure 16 hours of noise and are required by law to wait until 2300 hours to call police. Your shift started four hours before you could even act. You've been forced into a vicious cycle of endure, complain, endure. Ask yourself if you'd like to be the person being cared for by that person who had no sleep. We have found that the current bylaw for noise no longer fits the build for Wayne Fleet as a result of an unprecedented uptick in rentals, changing demographics, and use of properties. Life, the world, and Waynefleet have changed. Waynefleet has had a huge uptick in business use of residential properties, with the majority being rented during the summer months. Each and every one of us look forward to the summer, and as a result of these changes, full-time residents living near or adjacent to properties that typically are occupied by short-term renters have suffered a loss of peace, quiet, sanctity, security, and safety. Those adjectives support and they underpin Wayne Fleet's countryside, where a handshake meant something, where problems could be worked out amicably amongst one another, where neighbours knew one another, and it meant that bylaw wasn't receiving multiple calls, written complaints, and the police could be left to do policing. While many summer rental residences do close during the winter, allowing peace to be restored, those of us on Harborview are not afforded the same relief. In the past couple of years, full-time homes on Harborview have been purchased as investments and these rental properties have no downtime or season because they have a furnace. Snow, rain, cold inclement weather that keeps full-time residents indoors is no match for the renters. Harborview Homes and other Lake Erie abutting properties are not permitted to put up a fence taller than four feet tall as a result of the amended fence bylaw. Yet, another Waynefleet residence not living on the lake who wishes to erect a fence to dampen the noise from an adjacent neighboring property can. 
The investment properties on Harborview Road were once family homes that housed families. The street was attractive to those of us living there because neighbours were quiet yet friendly. The quiet residential zone street didn't have businesses or hotels operating on it, and in 2018, no one relied on the noise bylaw to control noise. In 2020, within a month of a family home selling on Harborview, it had multiple paying guests staying in it. We no longer knew who our neighbours were and had no idea who was inhabiting the property. The sense of security and safety from knowing your neighbour suddenly was gone. The once quiet family homes no longer are because they are advertised on Airbnb where rental fees and the listings are public knowledge and can be found in that public domain. And some of those prices charged necessitate multiple people or couples to defer cost. The ads also offer sleeping arrangements, not for a quiet family, but for numbers that would astound you. With renters sharing cost, it brings loud voices, non-paying guests who come to take, make the most of a free beachfront day, resulting in exponentially increased noise and nuisance along with overspilling driveways and congested roads. Summer of 21, the noisy properties were pretty much booked to capacity with groups that often varied between 10 and 25 people. The overflow persons didn't always leave, but they partied till the early morning hours. Some of the rentals advertised uh, for large gatherings which allowed commercial parties like weddings, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties. And while most of us can understand the correlation between celebrations, alcohol, and noise, um, you know, we can see that it's, it's just an increased liability. We observed groups of people that actually trespassed into adjacent properties for their own personal use, for wedding pictures to be taken, and the liability surely was unbeknownst to the registered property owners. Since the fall of 2020, the adjacent and direct neighbours living on Harborview have been consistently and constantly subjected to loud music, drunken parties, hot tub parties, harassment, sexual harassment, complete loss of privacy, drones being flown over top of your lot, over your deck, filming you. People urinating in the lake and on the property, loud fireworks displays, dogs at large, crowd and voice noise that penetrates the walls of adjacent houses with the windows and the doors closed, noise with a point of reception more than 225 feet away from the point of origin, necessitating a retreat indoors where you still cannot escape the noise. For the most part, the people renting are partying the entire time. They disturb the full-time residents' lawful use and enjoyment of their own properties. Direct and adjacent neighbours have suffered a loss of enjoyment and loss of use of property as a direct result of the actions allowed by the property owners who rent their properties. In spite of assurances and documentation that noise or nuisance is not allowed on the properties by those owners, we have reported and documented multiple incidents. In fairness to some of the smaller, more mature groups, um, you know, we acknowledge they weren't a problem, but they were the exception, not the rule. Logic tells us that more people means more noise, more trouble, and um, even what looks like a benign group can metastasize quickly. Attempts to communicate with some property owners have eroded because they rarely attend the property except to clean for the next group arriving. Some of the property owners themselves have hosted large gatherings. Uh, it, this included a children's party last summer with a PA system and speakers blasting the entertainer's voice and music all day long. Neighboring properties were sprayed with bubbles, which really weren't welcomed. Neighbors on Harborview endured the, the all-day event with kids screaming, the outdoor PA system blaring pop and hip hop music, and as a result of choosing to demonstrate some of the core values that Weanfleet residents pride themselves in, on a beautiful summer day, neighbours on Harborview could not enjoy their own properties, inside or out, because the noise had a point of reception 225 feet away from the party and inside their homes. Rather than file a complaint or call the police, Neighbours chose to exercise kindness, understanding, tolerance, acceptance, compassion, and respect. The PA system was a direct violation of Section 3F in the current noise bylaw, and while the owner and their guests enjoyed the day outside in the sun and surf, the neighbours sought refuge indoors. Last, if, last minute. Thank you. 
So it's only May. We've already endured several boisterous groups necessitating late night calls to the police, complaints to the bylaw, complaints to Airbnb, a late night text to the owner of the property that went unanswered, and a desperate request to the township for a meeting. So having had no success at regaining the lawful and enjoyable use of our property, when noise occurs because requests are ignored, we studied the noise bylaw and we identified barriers that allow some residents or property owners to obstruct, interrupt, or interfere the lawful use, enjoyment, or operation of adjacent properties. We identified what we believe to be a fiscally responsible and swift reparation to the loss of enjoyment and loss of lawful use of property for residents of Waynefleet. And those are on an extra piece of paper I sent in. Thank okay, you. that's uh, your 10 minutes. Uh Leslie, thank you. Thank you. Um, good points. Questions by council, please. Okay, no questions. Councillor Cridland. Uh, thank you, through you, uh, Mayor. Just a comment that I can see that we have this matter on the agenda, so uh, I'll hold my questions till then. Thank you. Okay. So um, it's, uh, our lawyer is uh, going to be speaking to the noise bylaw here in a little bit, and so you may want to be present for that. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for thank your presentation. You. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we uh, have a motion to receive that report, please. Moved by uh, Councillor Gilmore, seconded by Councillor Cridlin. Discussion? All in favor? And that is received, thank you. Now I look to um, Kathy, I'm, I'm probably gonna get your last name wrong, Budigeg? Budigeg, thank you, sorry, apologies. Uh, Horseplay Niagara regarding request for permission to use the beach area for the purpose of offering horseback rides to the public. And uh, you have uh, 10 minutes, so okay, great. the floor is yours. And I just need to know which button. Okay. So Horseplay Niagara has been providing horseback riding tours on the beach in Waynefleet for over 20 years. We employ more than 15 people and support local farms and businesses with our purchases of hay, feed, and supplies. Outdoor activity tourism-based businesses in Waynefleet include Skydive Burnaby, two golf courses, 905 Jet Ski Rentals, and Horseplay Niagara. Then there are the countless restaurants, gas stations, variety stores, hotels, cottages, Airbnbs, and trailer parks that benefit from the tourism dollars that we bring in. Our customers come from all over Canada, US, Europe, and the rest of the world. We've had customers from Dubai, Australia, China, the Philippines, and just about every other area of the world. We accommodate single people, couples, friends, families, engagements, wedding parties, birthday parties, and other celebrations. Our clients range in age from six years old to our oldest so far, who was 93 years old. If you go on Google and do a search on top bucket list items, Horseback Ride on the Beach is number one. Horseplay Niagara and Waynefleet have fulfilled these dreams for thousands of people over the years. Horseplay Niagara is the only horseback riding on the beach in all of Ontario. The winter landscape at the beach is unique and we are typically the only ones utilizing this area at this time of year. Horseplay Niagara offers the only tourism-based outdoor winter activity in Waynefleet. This is a sampling on what other people have to say about our beach rides. The view was stunning. Wish the beach part was longer, but we enjoyed it while we could. Super fun. The ride through the woods and the beach was unreal. The rocky beach experience was very different from other horse riding outings. Highly recommend. Rare opportunity to ride out to Lake Erie and a once in a lifetime experience. In 2020, the South Coast Tourism Association, of which I was a founding board member, received almost $474,000 of grant money to promote tourism for the community. And their mandate was to shop, buy, eat, and stay local, explore the region or the one next door, and the Ontario bucket list. 
Our own Mayor Gibson talks in response to this grant of the pursuit of a slower pace of country life, which is what our local residents want if social media is any indication. He also speaks of how tourism helps to strengthen our business sector and guide our township towards a strong and lasting recovery going forward. Past mayors have been supportive of both Horseplay Niagara and the South Coast Tourism Association in showcasing the local diversity to the world. And now for the number one complaint about the horses on the trails, horse manure. Unlike dog feces, horse manure presents no threat to human health, but of course nobody wants to step on it either. Our guides communicate on a, on a group chat with our cleanup crew throughout their rides, so whenever a horse defecates, someone can come and clean it up immediately. What most people don't realize, though, is that's not the only thing we clean up. We clean up dead animals off the beach, we clean up the roads, we clean up the garbage that doesn't quite make it into the bins, we clean up after the parties, We've even cleaned and properly disposed of car parts, household trash, building materials, tires, masks, dirty diapers, and human waste. You name it, we've cleaned it. Did you know that dog owners like to tie their bagged feces into the trees and bushes along the trails? We do. Our staff has been cleaning the road and beach areas since 1998. We had communicated with township staff for years regarding the need for installing garbage cans both at the beach and at the entrance to the quarry area. Finally, these items were provided, reducing the need for us to remove all the garbage back to our farm. In 2003, we were recognized for our organized efforts to remove several tons of trash from the Wayne Fleet area every year. We were honored to receive the Niagara Regional Environmental Award, which was presented by our own Gord Harry, at the ceremony in St. Catharines. Our staff has also identified and communicated to the Niagara Regional Police regarding crimes occurring in the area, helping to keep the area safe for all of our residents. COVID-19 presented all of Wayne Fleet with new challenges. We were fortunate to be one of the first businesses allowed to open due to the outdoor nature of our excursions. With people desiring outdoor activities though, the Lakeshore Road areas became heavily crowded and as a result of that, we started traveling up Lakeshore and Rathon Road to avoid the heavy car and pedestrian traffic. We understand this route has been inconvenient for this area and now that these problems have eased, we can return to some of our traditional routes that we took. Our summer route takes us down Quarry Road to the south side of Lakeshore Road on a path through the tree area above the beach and back out to the road. We travel alongside the road on the shoulder, passing the parking area with the bathrooms. We enter towards the water at the beginning of the stone area where people typically do not sunbathe or walk and follow a stony path along the lake back to the road. We circle back along Lakeshore through a path alongside the road and back to Quarry Road, where we return back up to the Gord Harry Trail. This route minimizes the impact we have both on all the locals and the Lakeshore Road traffic. We realize there are complaints, but please consider that for every complaint, there are literally hundreds of people, young and old, that are so excited to see our horses out there. Our stables are also popular with very many Wayne Fleet residents. A consideration to help minimize complaints could be posting a sign on the trail that says horse path by permit only. So not only are people aware that, that we travel there, but also other horseback riders that may, may travel into the area realize they cannot use the trail without permission. We sincerely hope that we can work together for a solution so we may continue to offer this unique tour to people all over the world. I would be pleased to answer any questions either now or in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. And I will ask uh, Council if there are any questions to our presenter. Okay, seeing none, okay. thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so we'll uh, have a motion to receive that uh, presentation, please. Councillor Gilmore, seconded by Councillor McClellan. Okay, move seconded. Any discussion? Oh, Councillor Cridlin. Thank you, Sri Mayor. Um, I would I would move that that gets referred to staff, please. Okay. Okay, seconder for that. Okay, if Councillor Van Vliet. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to admin staff report, right to disconnect policy. And we'll look to our... Um, our very own uh, uh, HR um, person to speak to that, Lee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this report, um, right to disconnect uh, policy. Um, as you know, um, recent amendments to the Employment Standards Act um, require that all employers with 25 or more employees uh, have a written policy in place by the 2nd of June uh, regarding employees' uh, ability to disconnect from work. Um, <clears throat> the long and short of it, of course, is that um, it just simply recognizes that there comes a point uh, with so much work being done electronically um, that em employees are able to um, essentially separate from work-related communications, emails, phone calls, and so on, um, and resume their work day the following day. Um, and this uh, report and the accompanying policy uh, speaks to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, potential motion being that admin staff report uh, 13 2022 respecting the right to disconnect policy be received and that council adopt policy and procedure HR 2.31.ON respecting the right to disconnect. A mover and a seconder for that, please. Councillor Gilmore, Councillor Van Vliet. Is there any discussion or questions of our presenter? Okay, seeing none. Uh, all in favor of receiving that, of the motion? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Perhaps I could exercise my right to disconnect from this meeting for five minutes. Yeah. Sure. In other words, can we we'll, take a we'll recess? Take a recess. Fine. Back in a couple of minutes.
Call our meeting back to order. And we're going to hear from Ms. Sturton on our noise bylaw. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of Council. The purpose of my attendance with you here tonight is to discuss the staff proposal to replace the existing township noise bylaw with a new noise control bylaw. The focus of the proposed changes to the bylaw is really twofold. First, it's intended to address gaps in noise regulation in the township presently, including those that are identified or were identified by the delegation that we heard from earlier. And the second focus is to really facilitate administration and enforcement of the bylaw. The primary method by which the proposed bylaw meets these objectives is by implementing a general prohibition against all noise that is unreasonable or that is likely to disturb township inhabitants. Some noises are deemed to meet this threshold either altogether or at certain times or places, but the proposed bylaw does not limit prohibited noise to those listed acts. The proposed bylaw also contains a definition of the term clearly audible to help determine if a particular noise, even if not listed, is prohibited. So these changes are in contrast to the existing bylaw, which prohibits only noise that is caused by or results from specific identified acts and that is clearly audible at a point of reception. However, the bylaw does not define what clearly audible means. Uh, the other key differences between the existing noise bylaw and the proposed noise control bylaw are summarized in the chart that is at page four of the staff report. Uh, and I would be pleased to answer any questions the council may have or to receive comments on the draft bylaw, uh, which staff intend to bring back for consideration at the next available meeting of council. Okay, thank you. Questions? Councillor McClellan. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So, you live out in the country. You cut fire, you burn firewood. I go to cut firewood on a Saturday. The sound of my chainsaw travels, I don't know, 700 meters, something like that. My neighbors can call and stop me from cutting firewood. It's an audible noise, right? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mayor, to Councilman McClellan, the, the bylaw does not expressly prohibit all noise that's clearly audible. Rather, it is careful to retain the discretion of the bylaw enforcement officer to assess whether a noise is unreasonable or likely to disturb. So there is, um, a, as a general legal principle, the township has fairly broad discretion as to how it will enforce its bylaws, provided that it acts reasonably and in good faith. So there is room uh, within the, the proposed bylaw for the exercise of such discretion. Uh, in the event that there is a complaint, the officer would nonetheless have to assess whether, it, whether the noise is unreasonable or likely to disturb. So it's not a foregone conclusion that chopping firewood would result in a valid noise complaint. Uh, it's simply that there's additional guidance provided within the bylaw to assess noise uh, if and when there's a complaint. So that's a whole lot of words, and I never got a yes or a no. It's up to the bylaw officer's discretion then, I guess is what you're saying? The, the purpose of the, let me back up, it's twofold. There are certain noises, as I've indicated, that are deemed to be unreasonable. And those noises are identified, um, they're quite, common across many municipal bylaws. They, they are derived from provincial guidance in this area. Firewood chopping isn't listed. Um, so there are certain noises that are deemed to be unreasonable or deemed to be likely to disturb, which is the threshold that's being proposed. Other noises may or may not meet that threshold, and that falls to an exercise of the discretion of the officer based on all the information that's provided. And that's uh, similar to how things would uh, work in other places as well. Okay, I'm just going to go to our CAO here for a sec. Thank you, Mr. 
uh, mayor to council and hopefully Jennifer I'm not speaking out of turn here but uh, the the sort of activity that you've just described with respect to chopping wood for example um, there is a very specific provision uh, in this bylaw uh, pertaining to the operation or use of tools for lawn yard or garden maintenance um, and I would suggest to you and I think a sort of a um, a, a, a basic interpretation of uh, chopping wood would fall into that category. So there is a general prohibition of that type of noise uh, between, um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find it here in the bylaw, 9 p.m. one day and 7 p.m. the 7 a.m. the following day. So basically, don't be chopping wood between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, and on Sundays or holidays, mm -hmm. um, that 7 a.m. becomes 10 a.m. So, so between 9 p.m. and 10 7 30, or yeah. 10 a.m., quiet hours. Okay. So, but okay. if you're chopping wood outside of those hours, um, then there is a very low likelihood or low probability that there would be any sort of um, restriction, if you will, that this bylaw puts in place on the chopping that's happening. Okay, so thank you. Go ahead on yeah. the, the mic. So there is also a provision in there, or a clause, that says if the noise is more than 10 minutes in a 60-minute period, that, that that's a problem. Now, I can't give you a paragraph of where it is, but that's in there. So again, if you're out with a chainsaw cutting firewood for five or six hours, that's noise. If I look to Jennifer, can you speak to that, please? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor McClellan, I, what you're referencing, uh, Councillor, is the definition of persistent. It's a defined term. But only certain activities are covered by the definition of persistent. For instance, animal noises that are persistent, as defined in the bylaw, are prohibited beyond that 10 minute mark. And I believe hooting, whistling, hollering, and singing that is persistent is also covered by that definition. Other types of noise do not incorporate the definition of persistent that you've referenced, and thus do not um, breach the bylaw in the event that they are 10 minutes or more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Van Vliet. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Jennifer. I have a, a couple questions. I'm gonna start by I know why we're tweaking this bylaw. Is there a way we can make it area specific? In, in what way? I want to understand the question more fully. Okay. We're, we're tweaking the bylaw to work around noises in the south end. Let's put it that way. Is there, an, can we make it specific to that area? Because that's where the, most of the complaints come from, specifically one area. South of highway. Through you, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. Councillor Van Vliet, I, I don't think that's an Can't option. It's, um, this is not a land use control bylaw. It's not a, a zoning bylaw. It is a, uh, a bylaw to regulate noise. Um, there is some capacity to regulate as to time and place, but I don't think it would be possible um, to restrict that geographically as opposed, uh, unless there were um, particular zones where, where the existing zoning could be leveraged, I, I think it would be difficult to do. Okay, I'm asking because with our fence bylaw, it is specific. It's specific to that area. <clears throat> as to where the rest of the township, their fences are at different heights. So I'm just wondering what the I, difference would be. I, know I just see our CAO here fence. wanting to jump in. So. Go ahead. Just for clarification, um, I believe the, the fence bylaw gets into the sort of geographic pre-existing conditions that uh, Jennifer, uh, the solicitor, just mentioned. Um, the, the fence bylaw speaks to uh, properties that uh, bound or, or, uh, or abut a body of water, which includes not only the lake but the Welland River or other streams or, or, or anything in that, in that case. Um, the, the, the noise or the sort of geographic isolation of certain things in the noise bylaw. Uh, the only thing that comes to mind, if, if I could, I'll propose this, and I, Jennifer and I have not spoken, but um, the question is perhaps uh, hamlet areas 
uh, might have different um, requirements just because of the density of housing and that sort of thing uh, versus an agricultural or a rural zone um, where the, you know, the houses are spread farther apart. Um, so again, that, that's something that we might be able to look into, but I guess in, in looking into those sorts of restrictions, uh, you'd have to consider the type of noise that you want to regulate within those zones and whether there's a reasonable tie-in um, between, uh, and again, reasonable in the eyes of the court, uh, tie-in uh, between what you're trying to regulate and sort of the land use that, that you're regulating it on. Okay, um, Councillor Van Vliet, just to finish up, anything? If I could continue. Yes, please. Um, I have two other points. Um, I have a hard time with the Sunday and holidays because my Sunday may not be the same as your Sunday, shift workers, what have you, and several different people celebrate all different kinds of holidays. So I'm, how do, like, does it go by the calendar? How is that going to go? Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the question. That, that is something we could certainly look at. Um, most municipal bylaws across the region do incorporate some sort of different treatment on weekends or Saturdays or Sundays or holidays, um, but certainly if, if that's not a requirement. If the appetite of council is to remove that and then have all days treated the same, that, that would be an option. Um, consistency in terms of the prohibited hours from my perspective is desirable so it's certainly something that we could look at if that's council's direction I have, sorry I have one more one more question um, I'm pretty hard on the 8 p.m. thing I have a grandson who just turned six and I'm trying to explain to him just because the sun's up it doesn't mean it's daytime so the 8 p.m. is is a hard sell for me because there could be an abundance of children out running around, you have one bad neighbor, and then, you know, we have chaos. Mm -hmm. So the 8 p.m. Is, is hard for me. Certainly, again, something that can be uh, considered. And also, um, again, there is the discretionary element. Uh, I would suggest that uh, perhaps a, a group of kids who are in bed by 8.30 might not attract the same kind of noise complaints as what we heard described earlier in the delegation. But yes, I, I take your point on that. That's something that can be considered. Councillor McClellan. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, for the area or geographic, most of our hamlets, any of the new ones, are one acre plus. So we, could we not say that any place where the majority of the lots in the area are less than an acre, then these noise bylaws take effect, which will cover pretty well the south coast down there and do what we want to do, and it's a geographical area. It's defined by space. So, you know, like I, I'm with Council Van V. Eight o'clock is ridiculous in my world and you know every other municipality is 11 o'clock and you know I get it there's a problem down there but it's because the houses are so close it's because of what's transpired in the world now that there's Airbnbs and short-term rentals so you know can we just control that area okay thank you Councilor Cridlin uh, uh, thank you through you mayor um, I'm just gonna focus on uh, five one L. Um, I think if I'm correct if I'm wrong, but I think that's the one that really speaks to the delegation tonight. Um, and you know, certainly has the eight to eight, um, which I think is new when it used to be like the eleven. So um, I think that's open for all of us to land on something that we're happier with um, based on what we've already heard. So that's one I want to make sure that we maybe either make a motion or an amendment tonight to be clear on that. I think we could come to agreement on L. Um, and then um, I think the per persistency aspect is a really um, huge improvement from what we've had. So that's a different kind of irritant. I, I can, I can, that's what's going to trigger my, I, the idea of complaining right there is that it's been going on too long. And for everybody else, that's a little longer, but I'm, it's not going to be the chainsaw. It's going to be the, the kind of things we heard today. So I would, um, I'd be happy for whatever, whatever proposal is that uh, moves that out from eight. I think eight's a bit, certainly in the summer, that's just 
going to cause less enforcement. Like it's, it's, so um, that, I think I'll just leave it at that for now and just focus on that and see if we can land somewhere as a council. Okay, thank you. So my sense is that we're looking for some more work to be done on this, uh, some changes and some further um, efforts. Any other questions? Councillor Gilmore. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Well, I don't really want to delay this, to be quite honest with you. I, as much as I uh, continually avoid treading into the realm of legislating common sense, I actually kind of like this, uh, which is, you'll probably find that unusual. But, um, and if it does nothing else, it'll probably help to maybe diminish the ever-growing culture of entitlement and make people actually go talk to their neighbor when they have to do something that may be slightly out of the ordinary and uh, come to some mutually beneficial understanding about how that's going to occur. And at the same time, it's going to deal with the problems that we heard from tonight and have been hearing from for some time. If you want to change that hour to 9 or 9.30, Let's get on with it. Like, I, I'm not, I don't want to kick this can down the road another meeting and then enact it. By then, it's the middle of July. These people have endured enough. So figure out what you want to do. I'm happy with it the way it's written, but I don't have the problem. So if you want to bump it, somebody, somebody make a motion to move it, and let's get this over with. Okay, so there were some desirable changes over here in regards to the clock and the timing. Yep. So, and I know Councillor Cridlin had a motion as well. Let's start with Councillor Cridlin. So, I'll, motion. thank you. Uh, through you, I'll um, just make the motion that we change the 5L uh, from the end time of 8 p.m. The amendment would be to 10, 10 p.m. to get us because the fines are still very significant on that uh, complaint. So that would be what I would propose, and if that can be seconded, we'll go from there. Okay, that so one. that is the motion to change from 8 to 10, seconded by Councillor Van Vliet. Any discussion on that motion in itself? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Any other changes that we would like to go? Councillor Cridlin. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cridlin. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so then on the schedule, uh, so of the penalties, uh, I'm gonna go 5.1F. Um, again, I was surprised to see that one jump to $1,000, and um, perhaps first I should uh, find out why that one was also selected. Uh, I certainly know the noise and the hooting one makes sense for the 1,000, but um, I have a hard time with that one also jumping up to $1,000. Okay, so are you making a motion to change that or? Thank you, Mayor. First, I'd like to just hear a little bit from staff on that. Okay. Through, through Mr. Well. Mayor to Council. Uh, I know as part of the review that was being undertaken by uh, uh, the solicitor, um, one of the steps of that review included a circulation amongst all staff, including bylaw enforcement staff, uh, CAO's office, clerk's office, um, all, all departments were, were consulted. And uh, I think the, um, the final version that was presented w was based on some of the interpretation that staff had of the direction that was given at the last council meeting um, regarding some bylaw amendments. Um, and again, keeping in mind that this bylaw does sort of break down the different um, types of noises um, slightly differently compared to the previous one. If that number is too high, again, staff are very willing and, and able to uh, amend uh, as per any direction that might come from council. Council Critlin. Uh, through you, Mayor, thank you very much for that, uh, William. So I would then, unless there, obviously there'll be more discussion, but I would move that that goes back to $75 until we then learn more on that particular complaint over time with reports. Okay, so that is moved. Is there a seconder? Councillor Van Vliet and discussion? Councillor McClellan. 
So I don't know what staff thought of it or talked about it, but maybe we can do that one on a stepped increase as well. So it's $75 for the first offense, maybe 150 for the second. You, you bump it up and then by the fourth one, you hit them for the thousand bucks. Councilor Cridlin, are you acceptable to that as a friendly amendment? Thank you, through you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to look to staff again whether we can carve one out for that kind of um, increasing uh, fee treatment. Um, again, in, in the absence of any reports, I'm still happier with the 75 till we hear that that's a bigger problem. Uh, so therefore, I wouldn't consider it friendly at this time. Okay. Th any other discussion? So that was... That, that's just on this point? You're yeah, we're just... Yep. This, okay. she wasn't uh, open yep. to that, so... I'm okay with that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Gilmore? Thank you. Just a question, Mayor. How, how did we land on the $1,000 for cutting your lawn after 9 p.m. in the first place? Who does that? But how do we get there? I don't know. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Again, as I say, uh, there was a sort of a co consolidated staff review, and one of the recommendations that came forward, I, honestly, I'm not sure which, which staff member uh, identified that as potentially a, a, th uh, a proposed amount. Uh, but again, it's based on the sort of past direction that we had with respect to certain types of noises and uh, dealing with them, I guess, um, directly. Um, I would comment that uh, one of the things that our bylaw enforcement officer did do prior to this meeting was a quick research of um, the number of complaints we've had regarding that type of activity occurring over the course of the last year. And I can advise that we've had zero complaints about that over the last year. Um, further in my sort of prior life in other municipalities, um, this sort of clause has been in noise bylaws uh, in every municipality I've ever worked for. And in those previous jobs, I've, I've likewise oversaw bylaw enforcement functions. Um, and again, I can probably count on one hand over the course of 25 years, um, the number of complaints we've received about this type of activity. Uh, and generally, if I could, um, the, the issue is generally resolved by having the officer attend the person who's doing the inappropriate work um, and sort of speak to them and educate them about the, the rules and we, we generally receive compliance. Um, I, I put that forward to you at, at this time. Uh, again, the option is I, I think moving down to a more reasonable uh, level at this, pay, at this point makes sense. Um, and if does, council does want to do a stepped uh, process, that's something that perhaps can follow in the event that we find specific instances of recurring situations uh, moving forward. Okay, Councillor Gilmore, carry on. Okay, well, yeah, I, I'm in favor of moving it back because he's never going to catch anybody cutting their lawn after 9 p.m. because it takes me 20 minutes. By the time somebody calls, he's still in Thorold. So it's totally redundant that it's even, I mean, it has to be here, yeah, but like, the, the thousand, I just don't know who pulled that out of mid air. Okay, so Councilor Kirlin has it at 75. Uh, we've discussed that well, that motion. It's been seconded. Councilor. Could I just McCall? add one, one yeah. to that then? One more. Mr. Mayor. Yep. 4.1J. Oh, I'm just hang, we got to finish this one. Okay. Yep. We well, it's the same thing. It's 5.1F, yeah. the amendment back to $75. Oh, yes. F and G. There's the same. Okay, F and G. Yeah. So uh, both of those go back to $75. It's been moved and seconded. Discussions had. All in favor? And that is carried. So that will make that change. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McClellan, now on to the next one you wanted to talk about. So I'd like some investigation into if we can do for the smaller lots in that area. I Totally agree, we need to get this done. But there should be, like I said, if we can control it on the south end of the municipality, which is where most of the problem is, and I don't think we're getting a lot of complaints from the rest of the township about anything. But if we can get it where you word it that it's on, where the majority of lots are under a, a one acre or however, can you, if you can do that. Because otherwise, I can't support this thing because it's, it's wrong across the whole town. Okay, go ahead, Will. Through you, Mr. Marion, again, 
I don't want to speak on behalf of the solicitor, but I think the issue that you run into, um, if, if you are going to sort of geographically um, focus on an area, um, it has to be sort of a pre-established, for example, a hamlet area or a residential lakeshore area, what, whatever existing designations we have, um, the, the sort of impediment or concern, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but um, is that if, you, if, if the bylaw gets challenged and is taken to court and council is unable to demonstrate the rationale or the sort of logical reason for specifying a specific area, um, then the likelihood of that bylaw being struck down by the court or that charge being struck down the court is very high. So for example, if you said all hamlet areas um, in the township where you have smaller lots, um, these rules apply, that, that's one way of doing it. But if you say just that specific hamlet or zone area, um, setting up special rules for special people doesn't work. We have to, these, rule, these bylaws have to apply generally to the community with certain exceptions uh, granted to, to certain individuals, which is what we've done in this, in this bylaw. And I don't know if Jennifer can add to that or speak to that. I'd be happy to comment briefly on that. I, I, as I indicated uh, earlier, I think any distinction based on geography would have to be based on existing parameters. For instance, uh, there are some provisions in the proposed bylaw that are applicable in residential areas only, and residential area is defined uh, to based on the current zoning, based on the zoning bylaw. So it would be possible to look at methods by which we could target some measures because I realize it's less of a concern here in the township, but the, the noise expectations in a commercial area, for instance, are going to be different than in a residential area and different than in a rural area. So there is some capacity to, to tailor the prohibitions or the restrictions based on existing land uses, but we would have to do that, from my perspective, based on on categories that exist currently, and they can't target people. They can't be arbitrary, as the CAO has noted. They would have to be applicable in a uniform manner across the township. Councillor McCollum. So the Lakeshore is designated Lakeshore Residential, is it not? And I'm sorry, the planners left. Yeah, I, I don't I know. know these, uh, I was looking. At there, there, gone, right? there are different zones down there, but so yes, primarily. If it is yep. zone Lakeshore rent residential. Can we just put it in that area? Again, I think we would have to look at residential areas more broadly, as opposed to targeting okay. a specific subset. So and, and, I, I guess you got to go to Hamlet's. And, and if I could, Mr. Mayor, the one other element is the, the protections that you wish to afford to those residents that are living at the lake, for lack of a better yeah. word. Um, those protections, is there a reason why you do not want to afford those same protections to a person who's living, for example, in Wellenport or a person who's living in Winger? Um, anywhere that you have, like you have to have, I guess there has to be a clear understanding of, of sort of why you're doing something in one area versus another. So just hang on, Mike. <laughs> so my thought is we get new Wayne Fleetists move in from out of town. You move in beside a farm operation. I grew up in the city. I don't like that noise, I don't like that smell, I don't like any of that. So I know it's standard farm practices, but they're gonna turn around and say, hey, he's making noise too early in the day, it's gonna be nuisance. If it only covers the densely populated areas, it takes that complaint out of the picture. Go ahead, it takes Bill. the hassle from the farmer. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to council, 
Um, again, the noise bylaw is a general nuisance control bylaw uh, regulation passed by the township and the Farming and Food Production Protection Act, which is provincial law, states that no nuisance bylaw applies to any normal farm practice that's, in a, in, that's happening. So bottom line is farmers are automatically uh, exempted from the provisions of this bylaw. So that, that, that's, that's not going to happen. You're still going to get the phone call. The, um, the one thing in my experience is as soon as you start arbitrarily delineating groups of people or groups of homes or anything like that, you're just asking for trouble. It's one of those things that's, that's just difficult to, to explain why you chose this and not this. So it's very complicated. It opens us up to all sorts of potential liabilities. I get your point totally. And, uh, but I'm just saying I, I can understand the complexity of that, as, as Jennifer said and as Will said. So go ahead, Councilor McCall. So how are we going to enforce this? We don't have people working at 9 o'clock at night. We don't have people working at 8 o'clock at night. Niagara Regional Police are going to get down and say, well, every other municipality is 11. This is a joke. And they're going to walk away. We're not going to enforce We're passing a bylaw that's great on paper, but will never get enforced. Okay, well, go ahead. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council, um, again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the solicitor, but um, with this bylaw in place, one, um, the Niagara Regional Police, uh, as police officers under the Police Services Act, do have an obligation and a duty to enforce municipal bylaws, particularly in the event that municipal bylaw enforcement officers are not available. So those would be those after hours types of, types of situations. Furthermore, um, one of the elements of this bylaw includes uh, the establishment of administrative monetary penalties associated with certain offenses detailed in the bylaw. And one of the neat things about administrative monetary penalties uh, the way the, the legislation is written is that when an officer has belief or in his belief an offense occurred, um, then he has the ability to issue that administrative monetary penalty. It doesn't necessarily need to be issued uh, immediately during the uh, occurrence of the event, um, but it can follow the event. So, for example, that party that uh, is happening at 2 in the morning, um, the residents call police to come out. Uh, police are perhaps tardy or dealing with an accident or unable to attend because of other circumstances. Um, they complain to the township. The township has the ability the following day, for example, to issue an administrative monetary penalty notice uh, to the owner of the property where the offense occurred. Um, generally, the way that happens, and we've been doing it with other offenses, uh, now that we've switched to administrative monetary penalties is that the officer will accept a sworn affidavit from the resident indicating that they were disturbed by the noise or by the event that was occurring um, and as a result of that the officer has a legal ability or right to sort of accept or acknowledge that sworn affidavit of the resident as being true and correct and he's able to act on that sworn affidavit and he can issue a penalty notice the following day. Um, so, yes, the township, an officer does not have the ability to intercept or cause a noise that's occurring to stop. He doesn't have the legal powers of a police officer to detain or to require somebody to stop making a noise but he certainly does have the ability to issue that monetary penalty after the fact uh, once he has <coughs> confirmed to his satisfaction, and again, a sworn affidavit is one way of doing that, um, that an offense did actually occur. So if I may, um, in regards to what you were commenting on, Councilor McClellan, you're absolutely right. It's Saturday morning, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, our bylaw officer is not working and it, realistically, you're probably not going to get police there either because they're involved in higher priority crimes. Um, so, but that's no different than anywhere else. Everywhere has that issue where, you know, there's not a bylaw officer and the police are tied up doing, you know, crimes against people as opposed to property. And so it gets prioritized. 
actually our bylaw officer through the through the um, statement we have a better um, ability through that to to do something than in the police if they can't come so it actually works out pretty good Councillor Cridlin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to acknowledge the work that's been done on this. We asked for this to come back very quickly um, without a lot of direction. This is a huge improvement to have any enforcement based on what we used to have, plus the amps that the CAO just uh, uh, very in-depthly explained. So I agree with Councillor Gilmore. We have to get something in. Um, if there could be some other comments later, uh, then maybe just how this gets um, communicated would be helpful as we get to the close of this subject matter, but I'm ready to support this. Thank you. S sorry, I can't hear you. I one more thing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Councilor through Mallory. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to build on Councillor McClellan, the lakefront actually is zoned RLS. I just looked it up in the official plan, so it has its own designation. So we've done, like I said before, we've done it with the fence bylaw. So I'm wondering if how we, if we can send it back, go with with what we're, the changes we're making now, but send back and see if we can make it area specific under the RLS zoning. Can we do that, Jennifer? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Van Vliet, I, I would have to look into that further just to make sure that that is defensible, uh, were it to be challenged. If we do that. If you're going to delay it, then this isn't going to get passed this evening, and it could be months before we get it done. So what is the ability for us to, if we were to pass this tonight, to come back and append it later on, amend, make an amendment to it later on? I just look to Jennifer or Will on that, please. Can we do that? Through you, I'll, I'll have to look to the clerk, because I do not believe we had this bylaw included for passage this evening. Um, the, the intent was to bring it back to you. Again, it was just last council meeting that council gave us sort of a broad direction to go back for a fulsome review, uh, and we have done so, uh, but we didn't feel we were quite ready to place it before you for adoption because, again, we, we sort of did our best to sort of interpret the need from the community, the sort of direction council had given. Um, so really it was our intent that this come back on June 11th, June 21st in any event. Um, and if, if that's too long, um, perhaps council would consider a special meeting uh, sometime before that. But uh, honestly, I, I don't think we're in a, in, a, in a state where we could sort of support or, or recommend it going forward this evening for final adoption. Okay, Councillor McClellan was first. Go through, ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I was going to ask Jennifer, like you said, you'd have to see if it's defensible. Was that a day's work, two days' work, the end of the week's work? And I was going to suggest exactly what Will said. If we have to come back for a special meeting, it's, it's going to be 20 minutes and it's over with. So if we have to do that, if, it, if it's next week, let's get it done, right? If you tell us that's defensible. It, it will take some time to, to be sure. So I would suggest in two weeks' time we could have a special meeting and, and have a more fulsome version of the bylaw with that question answered. Okay, Councillor Van Vliet was next. Sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor. Have, have we not done these on the fly before? We've, we've never no. done that? No. Can, can we start that? Like, we can't. No. Okay. Okay, Councillor Gilmore. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's just quit tinkering with it. And... Just tell us when you can schedule the special meeting to approve this. 21st is not an option. It should be probably Thursday. But um, I'll be away next week. You guys can do what you like. But this can't wait till the middle of June to get passed and then publicized. By then, it's the middle of July. So put it through the way it is and... Tell us when we're going to have the bylaw. Okay, I, I want to look to uh, Jennifer. How much can we achieve uh, in the defensibility part of this here within a few days? Can we be like 80% certain or is it, can we? We can be very close to sure by end of day on Friday. Okay. So, Thursday? When do you leave? <laughs> you're another, you're with the others. 
Can we do it Friday? Yeah, I'm good. Can you do it early Friday. I'm good. I'm away Friday. After. Friday. I don't have my phone. So three, three, Mr. Mayor. I think late in the day on Friday might be doable. I, I guess the question is, if, if council wants to push, not push, if council wishes to proceed with the bylaw in its current form as soon as possible, then any time on Friday is possible. If council wants to have that clear delineation of the geographical areas, um, then we are looking at uh, early next week because uh, frankly our solicitor uh, really won't be able to get to this until Friday morning and then if she's doing that sort of investigation, it's gonna take her the better part of the day, then we'll have to uh, sort of draft the necessary amendments or, or whatever to the bylaw to, to sort of implement. We only have her one day a week, right? Friday, yes. so. so. But we can still do this over Zoom, right? So, I mean, the world's electronic now. If we gotta do it Tuesday or Monday, whatever works. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Gilmore. Through you, Mayor, you can meet without me. That's not a problem. Uh, but I just don't know why, I'm not following the rationale for tinkering with it myself. Yeah, most of the problem is down there, but there are other people that are having problems that aren't in the, in the Lakeshore area. So I don't know why we're tinkering with it. Uh, and to be quite honest with you, I've heard enough and I'm going to move the previous question. Okay, so we uh, have it moved uh, for a motion and seconded by Councillor Gridlin again. And we've had lots of discussion, so we're voting on it now. And You're voting on just clarity, now. we don't know what we're voting on. <laughs> I, I couldn't hear Councillor Gilmore. Oh, I'm sorry. They didn't hear you. Well, we're, yeah, we're going to vote on the, the report as presented with the amendment of the one time that we... That the two amendments the are... The two are, times. Yes. That's what we're going to vote on now. Yes. So we're receiving this report and we're going to vote it into law with those changes that we made, right? The $75 on F1 and uh, F and G and the other one that we changed as well, which you've recorded, where we reduced the fines. That's what we're gonna vote on. Okay. Councillor Van Vliet. Are we changing the time from 8 p.m. to 11 Yeah, that's 11 been done. Okay. Yep, that's already so, passed. So, I'm okay with that. We do that, we pass it. Can this come back to us with the area specific at a later date? It would have to be amended by staff later on. So through you, Mr. Mayor, what I'm hearing is sort of take the bylaw as has already been amended, so that's the 10 p.m. and the fines for yard noise being reduced. Mm -hmm two fines for yard noise. So that going through imme immediately, and then a subsequent report at a future council meeting, a regular future council meeting, uh, coming back to speak to the whole issue of uh, special regulations yes. for a specific zone. Um, so that could be a separate motion after the initial bylaw is sort of directed for approval. And just on that topic, just for a question to the clerk, um, even though the bylaw is not specifically listed for passage tonight, um, if those are the only two minor amendments that are being proposed, um, is it possible for council to sort of waive its normal procedural stuff and actually put the draft bylaw as amended through this evening with, with other bylaws? Uh, through the mayor to council. Um, yeah, generally, it's not best practice when there's a bylaw of this nature that affects the whole community um, listed, not listed on the agenda. But um, I suppose that we that we can that we can include it for consideration tonight. If if these are the only amendments, um, we can include a motion to consider. Okay, so the motion is on the floor as amended with those uh, fine changes and the time change. It's been moved, it's been seconded. So I'm gonna ask for the vote on that now. All in favor and opposed, and that is now carried.
Pardon me? Subsequently. Sorry, Councilor Gilmore. Mayor, uh, just um, I, I, I appreciate the CAO's uh, comments to my concern. However, I think it's probably more prudent if you just give this a few days and have a meeting next week. That, that's, you know, like I appreciate the clerk's comments. I'm not sure that, like I want it run through, yes, but I just don't want to wait till the 21st. But I, 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 I'm trying to balance that with the, the right of the community to make, have a brief period to make any comments to any of us before this is passed. So I still think that you're better off to schedule something yeah, next week sometime. And I mean, you know, my concerns are, are well noted. You, you know how I would vote. Okay, so, anyway, so that point is taken. So perhaps we can have a special meeting next week. As for Councilor McClellan's points, it'll take literally minutes to do it. And uh, we motion. can. A motion to do that? So a motion by Councilor Gilmore for that. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor McClellan. Any discussion? All in favor of that? Okay, we'll have a special meeting next week. And that can be maybe in the day or we'll figure it out. So, one quick question. Councilor McClellan. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So, well, we're going to put this proposed bylaw as amended on our website tomorrow so we can start getting some comments, like you said, so the public has it. And no, because yeah. the bylaw has got to be passed yet. Just the report. Yeah. Well, the report's on there now, so. Yeah. yeah. So, so three, Mr. Mayor, what we will do is put a news item on the agenda tomorrow um, indicating that there will be a special meeting of council uh, next week to deal with <coughs> report number, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't have it in front of me at the moment. Doesn't matter, yep. Yeah. Okay, yes. perfect. Yep, just so people know, like. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, before moving on, one last item. So we've dealt with the draft bylaw as amended. We've dealt with the public meeting sometime next week. The last item, there was some discussion about, do you want to do a motion directing staff to further investigate the geographical implications of focusing enforcement on certain areas? And if so, um, that motion could also specify what noises, for lack of a better word, you want to control in those specific geographic areas. May I speak to that? I would like, <laughs> I'm opposed to that, to the geographical areas. As Councillor Gilmore made a very valid point, just because I don't live on Lakeshore, maybe I live on Wilford Road or somewhere else and I have the same issues as, as Lakeshore. I don't think, I, it's a broader stroke by having the whole municipality covered with that bylaw as opposed to special in one area. Secondly, I honestly believe, as per our council's comments and, and our CAO's comments, that we're going to ask Jennifer to do a whole bunch of work here, and I think she already knows it's not going to fly because it, it just doesn't work. Uh, arbitrarily picking places that uh, you want to apply a law to and other areas you don't want to apply a law to. So it sounds good. I'm not in favor of it myself. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't uh, push that forward, but uh, I think that uh, the bylaw should apply to everybody in the entire township. Councillor McClellan. So we do that on planning. We do that tonight. The guy came in and asked for four lots that didn't meet our zoning bylaw. We make exceptions all the time. So how come we can't do it here? Well, it's the same thing, if somebody starts complaining outside a hamlet or in one of the other hamlets, it's easy to amend it to include the hamlets later. But, I, but by I, covering the entire township with that bylaw, everybody's covered by it. Like, I don't understand why you want to cover some, one area and not another area. Why not just apply the bylaw to the entire township and let it go from there? And then it, it, it covers, as per Councillor Gilmore, maybe somebody over on Abbey Road that's... <laughs> you know, got an issue. Councillor Crillon. Uh, through you, Mayor, I mean, just to help this along, the CAO did suggest that someone make a motion. So maybe that'll help us uh, get through this piece. Nope. Okay, Councillor Crillon, you're making a motion? 
I'm Councillor Van Vliet. Sorry. <laughs> but Meredith was questioning something. Okay. Councillor Van Vliet, would you like to make a motion? Um, well, I agree with everything you said, Mayor, but we do have area specific for several things, including planning. The lot sizes are different out there. The fences are different out there. It's, and the noise is actually different out there because it echoes across the lake. So it's a different demographic, different area. So yeah, I would request that staff maybe look into um, the, zo the zoning RLS, which is residential lakeshore, to see if we can do that along with the fence by law, along with the lot, along with the coverage that we have. It's, it's different. The lake is a different entity. Okay, itself. so we have that motion. Is there a seconder for that motion? Councillor McClellan seconds it. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in. Is there a time to have that come back just before we, so it could be even a few months away because, I mean, the general bylaw applies now to everybody. So. Yeah, we have the one that we just put in place. We will so. put in place. So, okay. Yeah, it would be nice to, to get a little bit of feedback what we can do more for the people. Out okay. There. So all in favor of that motion? Opposed? And that is not carried. Thank you, everyone. I think we're ready to move on. <laughs> Public Works staff report. And we'll look to uh, Richard to speak to the site alteration bylaw. Thank you, Worship, and I'll, I'll try not to be long because I'm feeling like the Wizard of Oz character that's melting right now. Um, <laughs> uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of council. Before you use consideration, uh, Public Works Staff Report 11 2022. As council is aware of the recent developments and in infrastructure damage to some of our roads due to extensive amounts of large vehicles and the importation of fill within the township of Wainfleet. Staff and members of council have worked diligently to ask for assistance from various agencies to assist us in controlling this type of project, but have been unsuccessful at this point. This bylaw will allow the township to monitor the types of soils being brought in and where they can be placed or not, as not to interfere with our extensive drainage systems and water courses. Members of staff, including our town solicitor, has, have reviewed and modified the attached bylaw from the previous version and staff would like to <coughs> story, excuse me. Staff would like to make one note, uh, one small correction. Uh, Schedule A13 should read $750 from the 500 to match the other schedule. Uh, staff at this point are available for comments and questions uh, for council's consideration. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, potential motion. Public Works Staff Report uh, 11 2022 respecting the draft site alteration bylaw be received and that the draft site alteration bylaw appended to this report be presented to Council for adoption and that the Township of Waynefleet Administrative Monetary Penalty System bylaw be amended to include the new site alteration bylaw. Can I have a mover and a seconder to put this on the floor for discussion? Councillor McClellan and Councillor Cridlin is actually the mover on that. I saw her first. Okay, discussion. Councillor McClellan. Okay, through, through you, Mr. Mayor. We went through this before. This is way too onerous. They're asking for a $5 million letter bond as the town. I don't think there's a person in this room can get a $5 million bond that's sitting here right now. That means you need $5 million liquid to be able to get a bond for that. You're asking a homeowner to go out and do that? They'll never get anything done. We're going after homeowners that don't know about half load season, that don't know about how many tons are in a truck. This should all be gone after the commercial operators that are doing this. That's who's causing our problems. That's who's ruining things. You know, the poor guy came in here and we dinged him for his road damage. He hired a contractor to do the work. It should be the contractor that he know. The guy was, came here from New Zealand. He doesn't know what a half load is from or frost in a road for crying out loud. And yet we're dinging him for a huge amount of money. We're going after the wrong people. The MOE already has all of the load tickets. They know where it came from. They know all this. 
We don't have anybody that's going to check all that. We're asking people to have somebody on site all day because they need 25 loads of fill at the house or 50 loads of fill at the house. And Richard is never going to look at those tickets or anybody in the town. We, he doesn't have the time to do it. Now, we'll go one step further. A guy goes, he's going to build a house. He's got to give us a site plan. He's got to give a lot grade, and he's got to give new elevations. We issue a building permit. Our building official looked at all that. He should know that that lot needs 200 loads of fill to get where it is. Why are we asking for another $10,000 so you're going to cash the guy's check, then you want a $5 million bond? We can't, nobody can produce that. You have okay, to Okay, thank you. Contract. Richard, uh, comments, uh, please? Three, Your Worship, uh, I just want to clarify, there is an exemption for anybody that's uh, issued any, any other permit. Uh, for instance, building permits, if you're building a house and uh, it is a low-lying land and you have to bring your fill in for the septic bed, like we know all that's taking place. So anybody that's already applied for a permit is exempt from this site alteration bylaw because they already have to submit a drainage plan and that is covered under the building permit process. Uh, so they would be exempt from this anyways. This is to stop, uh, this is to stop the un... Uh, unacceptable volumes of, of fill that are coming in. Uh, the unfortunate part is we don't have the authority to go after somebody outside the municipality. Uh, and this is where our problem is. The only way we can actually uh, try to regulate is the lands that are within our municipality, and that's the only way we can try to, to, to curb the behavior that's taking place. Okay, uh, Will? And Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, in addition to the exemption for uh, properties that have already received other types of development permits from the township, uh, there are other exemptions that are included in Section 6.2 that uh, allow um, exemptions uh, for certain classes of land, certain, sorry, take that back, certain sizes of land um, that uh, are allowed to bring in certain amounts of fill without having to go through the permit process. So, for example, um, a, uh, a, a, a property or a site that is 0.1 hectares or smaller in size, uh, which is what, uh, about a quarter of an acre or smaller, something you might see in, in certain areas of the township, um, they can bring up to 10 cubic meters of fill, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's about a tandem dump truck full? It's one triaxle. One yeah. triaxle. So, yeah. uh, you know, somebody with a, a, a small residential lot can bring in one full triaxle of, uh, of, of fill uh, each year um, without having to go through the permit process. Um, if you're up to half an acre in size, that, uh, that's 10 times that. You can bring up to 100 cubic meters. Um, and if you're half an acre or half a hectare or larger, you can bring up to 500 cubic meters. Um, which, again, correct me, that's 50 triaxles full without having to go through the permit process. So this, as Richard said, is really targeted at dealing with the larger um, instances of fill that's being brought in and really hammering away at municipal infrastructure. And again, the purpose of it is to regulate that to some extent and make sure that its impact on the community is, is at least known to us and controlled to us, and we can approach the right people when those situations occur. What if you have 0.1 hectares and you need two truckloads? You need 20 cubic meters. What happens then? You need a permit. Even if, but unless you have a house permit, and that's covered off in that. Exactly. If they're building a house already, that's already covered. They won't, they won't need anything to do with this. Uh, I do want to clarify one thing as well. In the application process for this, um, they can have an agent apply for the fill process. That's where you come into where the contractor is bringing all this fill in. They will be applying on behalf of the landowner, but the landowner is still ultimately responsible for that, process, for that permit. So... so to get the bonding for these large operations, <coughs> we'll be the contractor that'll be have to provide that bonding for those large large operations. Okay, Councillor Cridlin. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, I just want to highlight that uh, you know this has been since 2019. 
that was identified and moved forward with council and with staff. So again, um, it, is a, it is a new bylaw, so we're taking that care. Um, I've had, well, we've done a, a committee. Um, there was output from that committee that has been incorporated. Um, so the, the risks of doing nothing again is, the, it's escalating as you pointed out, so we're having more damage. And one of the reasons I wanted this at the beginning was to protect the farmland. So I'm going to continue to refer to West Lincoln. They have one very similar to this. They put it out there. They had to make an amendment reasonably soon after. They made the amendment and then it's working. So uh, the limits that you've got in there are parallel. Most of the fees are very similar to West Lincoln. West Lincoln is very agriculture. Um, so I'm quite prepared to support it basically as it's presented. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Motion is on the floor. Seeing no other discussion. All in favor? Opposed? One opposed, that is carried. Thank you. Okay, review of correspondence. We have two items of correspondence listed on our agenda this evening. Uh, request for proclamation for World Hepatitis Day, June 28th, 2022. Is there any discussion on that correspondence to make that uh, proclamation here in Waynefleet? Uh, motion, anybody on that? Want to make that a, a motion to have that? Councillor Van Vliet makes that motion, seconded by Councillor Cridlin. Any discussion? Councillor McClellan? No, I'm sorry, I was. I, we were going to vote on it. I'm You're ahead of me. Up ahead of you. <laughs> yep, it's the heat. Okay. All in favor of that motion? That is carried. Thanks. Thank you. A Niagara Region Water Pipe Smoking Bylaw. Um, it basically just covers off smoking uh, water pipes, the same as smoking cigarettes. So uh, that, that motion is that Council of Township of Waynefleet consents to the passage of the water pipe bylaw of the Regional Municipality of Niagara being a bylaw to regulate water pipe smoking in the region. Mover seconder, please. Councillor Gilmore, Councillor McClellan, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. Are there any additional items of correspondence? Councillor Cridlin, perhaps? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for, um, so there's a correspondence uh, 2022-107. I believe I was able to notify the clerk about that. Um, and that is a, a correspondence from the city of Brantford. Um, and it'll just be a brief motion, but I just wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, uh, it was actually May 2021 when Tecumseh to to Squapam First Nations announced they had located 215 potential burials of children in unmarked graves at Kamloops Residential School in BC. <clears throat> the city of Brantford has a former residential school and is reasonably close to us and is demanding that those records also be released. Their resolution goes into very specific detail and I would encourage everyone to read the details of their motion. So the motion today is very brief that the Council of Wayne Fleet passed a motion to support the City of Bramford resolution dated May 18th, 2022, the copy attached that is respectfully calling for the immediate release to the Survivor's Secretariat of all federal and provincial documents related to the former Mohawk Institute Residential School, and that a copy of this support be sent to the City of Brantford, the Survivor's Secretariat, and of course our Niagara West MP and MPP. Thank you. Seconder for that, please. Councillor Van Vliet. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, another, is there another one? That's it. Councillor Cridlin? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McClellan. So there's a notice motion you were going to. Okay. After. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's it for correspondence. Okay. So we'll do our bylaws now. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the clerk to read those, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Uh, so the motion being that the following bylaws be read and passed this 31st day of May 2022. Bylaw number 25, 2022 being a site alteration bylaw to regulate the removal, placing, or dumping of fill in the township of Waynefleet. Bylaw number 26, 2022 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 27, 2019 being a bylaw to establish an administrative monetary penalty system for non-parking related offenses. Thank you. Mover seconder, please. Councillor Cridland, Councillor Gilmore, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is carried. I'm opposed. Okay, thank you. Notices of motion, Councillor McClell. So yeah. in front of you, sir. We're right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Councilor McClellan provided notice at the May 10th, 2022 regular meeting council regarding animals at large by law. And I also have a motion here moved by Councilor McClellan. And it is that staff be directed to amend Schedule A of the Township's Animal at Large by Law number 008 2018 to increase the penalties in Section 3A permit animal to run at large as follows. First offense, 250. Second offense, $500. Third offense, $1,000. Fourth offense, $2,000. And fifth and subsequent offenses, $5,000. And Councilor McClellan, would you like to speak to that, please? Yes, so I called a couple of fencing companies and our $75 fine covers uh, roughly eight feet of fence. 80 feet of fence, I'm sorry. So it, it, do, it doesn't hurt, it's cheaper to pay a fine than it is to go and fix your fences. So it's running $10 a lineal foot for a page wire fence. So if we're ever gonna get the animals off the road and you know it's a health and safety, life-threatening large animals, I don't know if $2,500 or $5,000 is enough because it still doesn't cover much Great deal of fence. Thank you. Is there a seconder for this motion? Councillor Gilmore seconds it. Is there any other discussion on it? Councillor Cridlin. Uh, thank you, um, Mayor. Uh, just if there's any other staff comments um, uh, about the the levels that were. Um, introducing, I think Councillor McCullen, you'd brought these up before, so we would sort of landed on an escalation type of yep. system for this. Um, but again, I think we're also not targeting a lot of individuals. So, uh, you know, for the first person on on an event, I don't know if that's still too steep. So, just a little bit more commentary from staff would be helpful for that first level. Thank you. Go ahead, Will. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor to Council. Um, again, as, as Councillor uh, Cridlin noted, um, this has been a subject of previous council discussion and there has been some sort of movement on sort of escalating fines um, as, as sort of you get repeat offenses, uh, particularly as, as noted by Council McClellan, original drafts of the bylaw, um, literally uh, given the significance of animals running at large, potentially being on a roadway, potentially being at night like right now, uh, animals being out can, can be a serious danger to the traveling public. Um, so certainly there is merit in, um, in considering escalating those fines. And uh, again, I think the, the amounts that are being proposed by the councillor in his motion that's detailed in the agenda clearly shows the sort of importance of that issue to council uh, by uh, moving from a, a base amount of um, $250, which really um, is, is almost a sort of inconsequential type fine for something of that magnitude um, through a series of steps where it doubles uh, on each successive event, um, bringing you to, a, to an ultimate of $5,000. Um, I think uh, it was looked at from a staff perspective as really demonstrating council's um, sort of concern regarding the, the the nature of the offense and certainly falls within the sort of limits, if you will, of the administrative monetary penalty system that the province sets up. So again, staff have no sort of concern or objection with this. Again, keeping in mind that, you know, 
fines or, or offenses, penalties such as this, um, you know, they don't get issued until there has been discussions between the officer and the person who's deemed to be offending. Um, they're made aware that, like, there's education that's done, and really it, it's the, the sort of person that um, is simply just not, not recognizing the significance of the offense that's happening. I'd be shocked if we ever got to the fourth or fifth offense, but you never know. Councillor McClellan, did you have anything more? Just one question, to, and this would be to Will. So these offenses, they accumulate. Does it accumulate over 12 months, and then all of a sudden, January 1st, you drop down, or they carry on for 48 months or 60 months? Where's the, where's the line when it just drops? For you, Mr. Mayor, I, I know historically um, we, we've sort of looked at it sort of on an annual basis. Um, however, since the adoption of these sort of revised fines, uh, that's some research we'll have to do to see just how long we can actually extend it. Because um, council does recognize um, that, uh, staff recognize council's concern, uh, but we want to make sure that we act within the limits of the law. Mayor. So we will certainly extend it as far as we can. Um, if it's in perpetuity, um, that would be wonderful. I don't know if, if we can do that legally, so we'll have to do that investigation. We can advise. You'll get back to us on that. Thanks. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, move seconded. It's on the floor. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, council shall now move into closed session. Oh, is there? Sorry. Sorry, Councilor Mayor. Gilmore. Um, just since I'll be, uh, I just want to back up one quick question about the noise bylaw. And since I'll be away, just for clarification, um, uh, seven seven one a emergency measures undertaken for the immediate health, safety, welfare of any person or persons for the preservation or restoration of property. I assume that covers standby generators. So they would be exempt under general exemptions. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to you, Councillor Gilmore, I assume that that would constitute an emergency measure, so uh, that would be- And for the preservation, preservation of, of- Property. Or restoration of property. So yes. Yes, they, would be, they would be exempt. They would be encompassed. The operation yeah. of those while the power was out Nobody could call and you wouldn't get a ticket. Through you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I concur, but I would add one caveat to that. Uh, a, a properly operating and maintained generator, um, if you modify it, and if I could, I've actually run through this experience, uh, if you modify it or the muffler is non-operational yeah. and you refuse to sort of correct or fix the, the broken unit um, and it's not operating as it was intended, um, you would be spoken to by the officer yeah. um, and requested to bring it into compliance so that in future it, it's corrected. But otherwise, yes, it certainly have an exemption. But yeah. keep in mind that it, it should be in good operating yeah. condition. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. but in general, they're, they're permitted. Yeah. It's a good yeah. question because we know we have lots of generators. Lots of people so. have those. Yeah, yeah, we have one too. All right, council now will move into closed session to discuss a item under 234-2K of the Municipal Act 2001, a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried, out, carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board to items, negotiation matters. And minutes of the closed meeting of council held May 10th, 2022. Mover seconder for that, please. Councillor Quillen, Councillor Gilmore, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And we will move into closed session. Thank you very much.